Hi, everyone. Welcome to the California Coastal Resilience Network webinar series. My name is Ella McDougall, and I am the facilitator for the CRN, as well as the Climate Ready Fellow for the State Coastal Conservancy. A little background on the California Coastal Resilience Network. We're a group who promotes knowledge exchange through periodic webinars on climate-induced impacts on human communities and coastal habitats. If you would like to sign up for future webinars, you can do so at our site, and we'll provide a link to that site in our follow-up email, as well as previous webinar recordings, including today's. Today's webinar is called Adaptation Strategies for Coastal Roads. We're hosting Alyssa Mann of the Nature Conservancy, Mike Grimm from the City of Carlsbad, and Jessica Davenport from the State Coastal Conservancy. They will each present their own coastal road adaptation projects from around the state of California. So let's get to know our three presenters a little bit today before we begin. Alyssa Mann is the Coastal Project Director at the Nature Conservancy. She is based in LA and focuses on developing and implementing nature-based strategies and policy solutions to ensure a more resilient California. She manages TNC's climate adaptation demonstration projects, including restoring and revitalizing Ormond Beach in Oxnard, California, and the project she will discuss today, nature-based adaptation of Highway 1 and Elkhorn Slough in Monterey County. Mike Grimm is a senior programs manager at the city of Carlsbad. He has over 25 years of local government experience, including land use planning, habitat conservation, and climate planning. He currently administers the City of Carlsbad's Climate Action Plan and oversees local climate adaptation efforts, such as the project he will discuss today, the South Carlsbad Boulevard Climate Adaptation Project. And our third presenter will be Jessica Davenport, who supports the creation of resilient landscapes for people and nature in the San Francisco Bay Area as Deputy Program Manager for both the California State Coastal Conservancy's Bay Area Program and the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority. Her work focuses on funding habitat restoration projects and related flood protection and public access in the San Francisco Bay Area. She leads the State Route 37 Baylands Group, which promotes the integration of planning for highway redesign and landscape scale habitat restoration in the North Bay. And this will be the focus of her discussion today. We will listen to and watch these presenters uh, today for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have a follow-up Q&A session. So during their talk, if you would like to submit questions, please do so using the Q&A function on this GoToWebinar platform. I will collect, review, and read the questions, and then the panelists will respond. And again, just to remind everybody, the webinar is being recorded and will be available for review. So with that, let's get to the presentation, and I'll switch it over to Alyssa. Here we go. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. Okay, let me select the right screen. Uh, how's that? Can you see my presentation? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, great. I'm gonna keep my video on for right now, um, but if I'm having some bandwidth issues or audio is going in and out, I'll turn it off. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for spending this time with us today. Uh, I also wanna thank Ella and the network for the invitation and in organizing this webinar. I'm thrilled to be on this panel to hear about the great work around the state uh, to advance nature-based transportation adaptation. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be talking about the Central Coast Highway 1 Climate Resilience Study focused on Elkhorn Slough, Highway 1, and the Elkhorn Rail. Again, my name is Alyssa Mann and I work for the California chapter of the Nature Conservancy. I'd like to recognize my partner on this work, Dr. Walter Hetty, Senior Coastal and Marine Scientist here at TNC, and our great partners on this project, some of uh, who may be on the call today, uh, Heather Adamson from the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, Charlie Colgan from the Center for the Blue Economy at the Middlebury Institute, and Bob Battaglio and Tiffany Chang from Environmental Science Associates. While you'll be hearing from me today, as you'll see from this presentation, this was very much a collaborative and multidiscipline project. And if there are questions I can't answer, I'd be happy to hunt those uh, answers down for you uh, from the team. So there we go. 
You may be familiar with the uh, Conserving California's Coastal Habitat Study. I gave a presentation to this network on that effort a while back, which actually seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, this study was a joint effort of the Coastal Conservancy and TNC to understand nature's ability to adapt to rising seas, specifically our coastal habitats. Uh, this study was the first California statewide comprehensive assessment of the vulnerability of habitats, imperiled species, and conservation lands to sea level rise and provided strategies to adapt these critical habitats. And while the results feel uh, dire, with 59% of coastal habitat area highly vulnerable to loss with five feet of sea level rise, it also revealed a pathway to maintain these critical habitats and achieve no net loss. We identified adaptation strategies to ensure coastal habitats can keep pace, adapt, and migrate with sea level rise. But this analysis uh, showed us that we can't get there with conservation alone. We must also adapt the built environment with a lens to nature, um, which uh, to enhance nature's resilience, which in turn you know, helps to advance community resilience. So our team on this project considered two things. Um, what might be the biggest interruption of nature's ability to adapt to rising seas? And who are the biggest stakeholders to engage for large scale impact? And really transportation rose to the top for both. Uh, the transportation system along the coast is vulnerable to sea level rise and coastal storm events. A TNC analysis estimated that about 90 miles of the 650 mile uh, Pacific Coast Highway is at risk of flooding by 2100. And we looked at six hotspots uh, where the highway crosses estuaries, including Elkhorn Slough. Uh, you can see this um, inset for Elkhorn Slough, which shows uh, extensive flooding. Uh, in blue and vulnerable highway in red. When we showed this analysis uh, to, of PCH to Caltrans a few years back, the director at the time said to our team, we need to do this. Where do we have all we need to do a pilot study? And so this is how we arrived at Elkhorn Slough for a demonstration, where transportation infrastructure and habitats were both at risk and we have uh, high resolution data. And with AMBEC in the lead, we convened a diverse group of engineers, physical scientists, ecologists, econ um, economists, and transportation planners to co-develop a transportation adaptation approach with a focus on strategies that will um, benefit nature while also conferring long-term benefits to people. The area of focus for this study looked at eight miles of Highway 1 through Moss Landing, as well as uh, five miles of railway, which runs along the main stem of the slough. The corridor connects two regionally important cities, uh, Santa Cruz and Monterey, and is considered as providing inadequate transportation function today. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with this corridor, it's when Highway 1 narrows to two lanes, it's notorious for traffic jams during commuting hours and, and safety concerns. Uh, sea level rise and the potential increase in the frequency and intensity of coastal storms will lead to more disruption and impact uh, to the highway. And the risk here is significant. Elkhorn Slough, Moss Landing, and the transportation system in the area are vulnerable to flooding and sea level rise. Uh, according to our study, as early as 2030, this stretch of highway could experience regular storm flooding and as early as 2050 for tidal flooding. The marsh area is especially vulnerable. About 85% uh, is projected to be inundated with five feet of sea level rise. And this is primarily due to topography characterized by low-lying areas with steep slopes, as well as some development constraints, uh, which really means that there's just a lack of space for habitat to migrate. And one important note to make here, you know, the loss of salt marsh in the slough does not mean that the slough will be lost to sea level rise and won't continue to provide critical ecological value. It will, but what sea level rise is projected to do is accelerate habitat conversion from salt marsh to mudflat to permanently drowned estuarine waters, you know, really sharply decreasing habitat for marsh dependent wildlife species. So as many of you know, Elkhorn Slough is very special. Uh, it's the seventh largest estuary in California uh, and is one of the least developed and most conserved in the state. It has several designations of international importance, over 2,600 acres of intertidal marsh and uh, mudflat, actually the third most extensive salt marsh in California. Uh, eelgrass beds that are stable are expanding, unlike really the rest of the state where they're shrinking, supports a wide uh, array of species, including 100 fish species, 500 species of invertebrates, 100 threatened uh, southern sea otters, uh, habitat for 
20,000 migratory shorebirds, uh, habitat for snowy plovers, and it's really prized by the local community uh, with visitors coming from all over the world to see it. So this project, uh, it was a unique partnership between the groups here. And the main question we were looking at was what transportation improvements and nature-based strategies could work in tandem to simultaneously enhance ecological uh, and transportation resilience through the SLU um, under future conditions, including sea level rise. Our hypothesis was to test what the literature is telling us, that if planning is done together to integrate regional development and adoption of natural infrastructure and transportation planning, it can provide better outcomes for both sectors. Uh, and this can be through more responsive regional transportation, uh, shared funding, preservation or enhancement of nature's values and benefits, and a, and a more streamlined process. And actually new uh, guidance from the Federal Highway Administration and California policy are encouraging this integrated approach, um, although there are, there are you know, relatively few demonstrations that have been implemented. So our goals were threefold. Um, develop and study transportation corridor concepts and sea level rise adaptation approaches that uh, improve transportation safety and efficiency, promote um, healthy coastal uh, habitats, and provide economic benefits to the community. And this study was planning level uh, to understand the risks and, and really the range of potential adaptation scenarios. It was not to select like a specific adaptation alternative as part of an actual uh, transportation project. Um, this corridor hasn't had a detailed analysis in decades, almost 20 years since the last corridor study, uh, and is really not um, on Caltrans like 10 year project list or anything other than routine maintenance. This project was to begin to understand the issues at play, examine pathways to resilience, and ultimately show that it, it did need to be on the priority list for adaptation. This is a complex issue with lots of stakeholders, many of which are doing climate adaptation planning themselves, uh, which influence and intersect with this uh, effort. Our steering committee was, was really essential to this proce process from start to finish uh, in developing the scenarios to evaluate helping us narrow them and, and producing and, and um, giving feedback to the final report. We used a series of modeling efforts to evaluate different adaptation scenarios um, using the constructed topography and altered hydrology of each adaptation scenario. We modeled sea level rise and resulting flooding, ecological conditions, transportation utility, and fed all that into a dynamic cost benefit analysis um, and this also allowed us to speak to the importance of timing of all of, of both, you know, of the ecological transportation and economic benefit. Again, we sought transportation strategies that would enhance resilience for both the infrastructure itself and adjacent ecosystems. So unlike the typical approach, we didn't just consider sort of the footprint of the transportation infrastructure and seek mitigation, but instead sought to, uh, approaches that may benefit the entire system and we conducted our modeling and analyses uh, at that scale. While I'm not showing the complicated graphic of uh, adaptation pathways uh, really because of time, uh, we considered a wide range of approaches and pathways from adapting in place to retreat and rerouting. Um, initial modeling runs and input from the community help us narrow these to these three you see here um, for more that would go through more extensive modeling and analysis. This includes two adaptation in place scenarios and one relocation scenario. There were different, uh, two different manners of adapting in place for our final modeling consideration, um, elevating on fill pictured on the left or elevating on piles pictured on the right, each utilizing ecotone levees, uh, which are the yellow hashing. And so ecotone levees are, is when you use a much gentler slope, like a 20 to one ratio, rather than steeper slopes of kind of typical engineering. Um, as shown in this photo, um, this gentler slope provides more area for all habitats from mud slats, flats to salt marsh to transitional marsh to upland habitats. They also provide a buffer between the habitat and, sens and sensitive estuarine habitats. Uh, on the left, the highway is elevated on fill with an ecotone levee um, sloping away from the highway outlined in red. On the right, the highway is elevated on piles. However, we still use an ecotone levee uh, from the wildlife area, really used to pre preserve the function of the wildlife area, uh, then gently sloping under the highway on piles over the water's edge. Um, 
each provide a, a large area for habitat restoration and resilience um, that would otherwise be submerged by open water. And you can also see um, dune enhancement in yellow hashing along the coast. For time, I'm not going to get into the details of the rail adaptation, but that also included significant marsh restoration, approximately about 700 acres, and railway infrastructure conceptual design to support that goal. AMBAG led a regional transportation demand model to evaluate transportation performance of each adaptation scenario relative to a new, no action scenario. And this model looked at a, a wide array of transportation metrics, and you can see how sort of each one performed uh, given some of those metrics. We used uh, the sea level rise affecting marshes model, also known as SLAM, um, to model habitat evolution on the change topography and hydrology of each adaptation scenario. And so some of the key findings, um, the impact of sea level rise really far outweighed uh, impacts of current and future highway alignment and footprint. But uh, adaptation of the highway with nature-based elements can help reduce the loss of habitat. Uh, it's clear for this case study, highway adaptation is not the silver bullet to prevent salt mar loss of salt marsh, but addressing the highway um, uh, with the minds for how it can be done to maintain and enhance salt marsh uh, and other habitats throughout the estuaries is, is super important. And it'll be important in concert with other strategies, including investing in uh, the protection of potential future habitat, as well as managing in place for resilience using uh, sediment augmentation or other methods. The use of ecotone levy uh, enhances resilience and creates habitat. Uh, this is the green infrastructure approach that works to create a buffer around sensitive habitats, creating more habitat area, uh, area for habitats to migrate into a sea level rise, and provides protective services uh, to the infrastructure it's attached to, which enhances resilience of both infrastructure and habitats. Since I didn't get into the detail on the rail, I'll skip this one for time. Um, and finally, I'll just say, you know, as the um, Alcorn Slough Reserve folks uh, can uh, remind us often, um, there will be changes. There will be habitat losses as well as habitat gains, uh, particularly for underwater habitats. And the goal here is, is really to support a healthy estuary supporting several different habitat types. Uh, quick on the benefit cost analysis, it was conducted to examine um, the economic consequences of selecting one of the three adaptation scenarios relative to a no action. Looked at questions like, um, can we get more back in benefits than we give up in expenditures? Uh, how do they compare against each other? Given the high uncertainty of sea level rise, how can we assure the greatest chance of a positive return? And, and also related to that, at what year does adaptation really need to be in place uh, for those benefits and, um, and to be able to avoid some of the large costs? A couple quick findings. Um, first, no action is really just not a tenable option. It had the highest cost and costs far, far outweighed the benefits of no action. And then adaptation really needed to be in place by the 2050s um, to ensure benefits to transportation and habitats. So in summary, I think there was a lot to learn for this region and beyond. Uh, first, choosing to adapt is really not a viable option from every lens we looked at the issue, whether that be from an ecological, transportation, or economic perspective. Oh, do I have a comment here? Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, and the transportation sector can and is embracing adaptation through conservation. What we heard from our partners at Caltrans District 5 is that they're talking about and sharing lessons um, kind of across the department about this project. Next planning needs to be in now. We, re we really can't wait. And we need multi-sector cooperation. The typical would be for the transportation sector to do their planning and natural resource managers to do theirs. And perhaps we meet at the end to talk about mitigation. And while it was really challenging and often contentious, as those that participated can probably attest, uh, but having everyone at the table developing the adaptation, the strategies together, I think led to more innovative solutions. So where do we go from here? Um, with AMBAG in the lead, they'll be incorporating the study into regional and metropolitan transportation plans. The Elkhorn Slough um, NUR is continuing to plan and implement habitat restoration, beginning first in expanding Hester Marsh and then looking at other critical areas. Certainly the study also revealed how important protecting areas of future habitat will be and we at TNC are really interested in this. And we will continue to work with Caltrans to help scale this approach 
uh, to other locations. Uh, we'll also be looking at policy solutions and funding sources at the state and federal level to help support these type of uh, types of multi-benefit adaptation projects. So I just wanted to leave you quickly, I promise only about 30 more seconds, uh, with a short clip from our virtual reality experience. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the audio um, to broadcast over GoToWebinar. Um, uh, so Ella will put a, a link to the whole thing in the chat. But here, let me just skip to where I want it to be. There we go. And um, yeah. And we developed this uh, virtual reality experience to help us communicate about this project specifically and to better understand its potential application in communicating with the public and stakeholders um, on climate change and adaptation more broadly. It shows both risk and potential solutions uh, using the data and analysis uh, that was developed um, in the study. And it's available now, actually, <laughs> for download at the Oculus Store if you happen to have Oculus or, or VR goggles. Um, but we'll soon be um, also uh, sending out links to a phone application and a web application um, to see it that way as well. So with that, I will stop sharing. Fantastic. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, and I did put that link to the YouTube video in the chat, as well as a reminder for everyone to submit your questions through the Q&A function. And now we're going to switch to Mike Grimm of the city of Carlsbad. Take it away, Mike. Great. Going here. Alrighty, thank you. Can you all hear me? Great. So uh, please uh, bear with me here. This is the first webinar I've done on GoToWebinar. So let's see our show the screen. And um, go. Okay. Is that looking good, Alan? Yep. Okay. Go right cool. ahead. Thanks. Thanks. Well, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank uh, thank everyone for the opportunity to present um, the Coastal Resilience Network and all of you for for joining us today. And a huge thanks to the Coastal Conservancy uh, for the Climate Ready Grant that made all of this possible. Um, this uh, first slide is a good overview of the project area. Um, it's a stretch of roadway about a a little over a mile that uh, runs right along the coastline. It's our essentially our coast highway through that stretch of Carlsbad. As you can see in the uh, left part of the image, there's the southbound lane, uh, which is closely adjacent to the coastal bluffs. And then it dips down and crosses uh, Encinas Creek there. Um, we've already had a lot of erosion, as, as you can see in the foreground. Actually, I believe that's some uh, area that used to be the old highway. So this is a receding bluff and uh, it's important to address it. The uh, project team is uh, down below there, it consists of the Coastal Conservancy and the city of Carlsbad, along with Scripps Institution of Oceanography and their Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation. And then we have the consultant team of GHD and KTUI, KTUA helping us with this. Uh, many of the exhibits you'll see in the presentation are from uh, the consultant's listening session PowerPoint, so thanks to them for that. So, See if we can advance it. So uh, why are we doing this? Well, it, there's a severe necessity for it. South Carlsbad Boulevard is a major north-south transportation corridor and, and coastal access route. As you can see, it's a beautiful stretch of um, undeveloped coastline, except for the roadway. There's nothing between the road and the ocean. Provides a lot of uh, aesthetic um, and coastal access uh, views. The area around Encinas Creek, we, we've already had some erosion um, within the project area where the bluff is right up against the pavement and then the Encinas Creek area has traditionally just been pummeled. Uh, we had to rebuild the bridge back in 2010, uh, put in some emergency revet protection to protect that bridge back in 2015 and 2016. Uh, even with all of that, the southbound lanes are subject to lane closure during and after storm events, uh, both from flooding and from uh, the vaulting of debris, uh, cobbles and other debris up onto the roadway. And then looking into the future, uh, on the recently completed sea level rise vulnerability assessment shows a complete loss of the southbound lanes at the uh, two meter uh, sea level rise scenario. 
pictures are worth a thousand words. So here you go. Up in the upper left, you can see the erosion that was occurring prior to us installing that revetment. And then in the uh, right and the lower area, you can see some storm surge along with king tides, the lane closures, and some very brave uh, project engineers trying to get some action shots there. Um, I have yet to see the uh, picture that they actually took. I suspect it's kind of blurry because they were moving around. From a modeling standpoint, uh, here you can see uh, what our projections are for uh, sea level rise uh, and the resulting cliff hazard zone uh, from 2070 all the way up to uh, 2120 H++ scenario. In the lower left, you can see the uh, two lane divided highway coming along and then that southbound lane just goes right into and through those uh, colored bands showing that it is gone by that point. So our project goals um, are multifaceted. This isn't just a roadway project. Uh, we do want a resilient multimodal roadway design and uh, resilient meaning that um, uh, resilient meaning that the coastal hazards uh, that are exacerbated by sea level rise or can be accommodated and then multimodal accommodating bike, both uh, the road bike people and the casual biking people as long as pedestrian as well as pedestrians. We want flexible recreational coastal access spaces. And what that really means is that we want to be able to provide recreational coastal access continually through time. So that has to be um, adaptive to the receding bluff and the changing circumstances there. We want appropriate habitat restoration, most notably in the Encinas Creek area. Uh, we want to make sure that that complements Carlsbad's existing HMP, takes into account the existing and future um, uh, situations, and then also provide some ecosystem value. Uh, continuous stakeholder and public engagement is very important here. Um, project areas like the recreation and uh, public access are going to change over time, and we need to continuously engage stakeholders in public engagement uh, to maintain that dialogue so that we can make sure that their needs are heard and addressed. And then probably one of the big key um, goals that we have here is momentum. Uh, we've been studying the realignment on and off for about 30 years, most recently in the 2012, and the projects have never come to fruition. So we want this Coastal Conservancy grant-funded effort to provide that momentum to continue into final design, permitting, and construction in a seamless manner. The project area is shown here. Um, if you're familiar with Carlsbad, uh, the uh, area of the red is near Palomar Port Road all the way down to about the uh, north part of the state campground. Uh, that's our adaptation study area. We're looking at roadway realignment and the community vision areas. Then we also have, as I mentioned, we have Scripps Institution of Oceanography on board doing some detailed cliff erosion study areas. And that's gonna be the entire expanse from Terramar all the way down to Ponto or Batahitas Lagoon. So uh, we applied for and received the grant um, late 2019. The council accepted the grant in May and we just kicked off the project in July. So we're, we're just starting this project. Um, the grant to find project tasks um, are listed here, data gathering and listening sessions, um, and then cliff hazard analysis in two phases, uh, preliminary adjustment of the Cosmos model, which you saw the results of already in the previous slide, and then more detailed projections, identification of hotspots uh, where we think the cliff erosion may, um, may, may happen quicker and uh, we need to address that either in design or in some kind of um, living shoreline application down along the coast. Um, both the data gathering, listening sessions, and cliff hazards analysis are intended to define the constraints and opportunities to inform the design work. Also to um, put kind of some parameters on what this project can and can't do. So people are, are dealing with the best available science and not just thinking pie in the sky alternatives. Uh, the concepts, we have three phases there, preliminary concept design, which we've started and you'll see just one of the examples of that. Uh, then we'll go to conceptual design and then the preferred 30% design. All of those phases, uh, as this is a stakeholder driven process, all of those phases um, include workshops, uh, opportunity for stakeholders and public input, and then also check-ins uh, and seeking direction with city leadership. So one interesting aspect of this project are the listening sessions we're having. Um, we're the very beneficial component and what we're doing is engaging the key stakeholders that will be involved in project permitting, environmental review, as well as State Parks, who's a major property owner and steward in this part of the coastline. 
what we're doing is taking about 60 to 90 minute sessions. Uh, we introduce the project to like-minded groups of folks. For instance, the wildlife agencies attended the same one. And uh, then we, uh, after introducing the project, we uh, provide them a bunch of interview questions, trying to elicit what their, uh, what their thoughts are about the project, what their expectations about the project would be. And then really importantly, just opening up that ongoing collaborative process that will continue throughout the project. We'll keep, keep folks informed as uh, key milestones are, are, um, are met and such. Uh, so far, we've done California State Parks, Coastal Commission, uh, local regional water quality control board, Army Corps of Engineers, state and federal wildlife agencies. We still need to engage with some shoreline groups and NGOs, as well as some uh, multimodal transportation folks, Caltrans, and our local Council of Government, SANDAC. Oh, excuse me. So, uh, starting on the preliminary roadway design here. Um, these are just a couple examples shown down below there. Uh, once again, I'm, I mentioned we want to have resilience to coastal hazards and flooding, and we also want to incorporate the general plan mobility element that was recently adopted in 2015. So on the, once again, these are just a couple examples of the various uh, preliminary alternatives we're exploring, and certainly nothing set. But in the lower left uh, exhibit, you can really see how that coastal hazard area is defining uh, where that roadway alignment, the footprint of that roadway alignment, given the constraints. Um, you can also see there in the left part of that uh, lower left image, a green hatched area. And that's one of the community vision areas that we're looking at um, at the Palomar Port Road and, um, and uh, Carlsbad Boulevard intersection. On the right side, you can see uh, an area where the um, roadway interacts with the Encinas Creek area. Currently, that's just a bunch of fill. Um, on that, what is now the northbound lane. And uh, with some culverts there, we're exploring um, having an open span bridge that will increase the water flow and connectivity, both uh, habitats and, um, and uh, with the water. Uh, we're also exploring um, that area to the north, or excuse me, to the, to the east in the upper part, um, including that into the habitat restoration area. So speaking of the habitat restoration, here's a couple shots from that uh, northbound area where we hope to have a future bridge, um, one looking west, one looking east. Um, there's lots of opportunities here. Um, it's given the heavily disturbed uh, state of the existing uh, vegetation. We're taking a look at the uh, topography and elevations and uh, looking at what, what kind of marshland we might be able to um, to create there. And um, we've also got some opportunities for upland restoration. There are gnat catcher in the area. So this could provide some really good habitat for them. And as I mentioned, we're looking at the uh, property uh, east of the roadway, even though it's kind of outside of the footprint of the project itself, but we want, it's currently under private ownership, but we think it's ideal to take this whole system um, in one big approach. Uh, the project's also going to be including uh, multi-use trails and coastal access. Uh, we want to have uh, pretty much an enhanced coastal trail along the area, probably use at first using that southbound lane that would be uh, abandoned. Um, this would be serve as a coastal trail for, for biking and pedestrian access, and then also some vertical access uh, where it's appropriate um, at key locations, um, probably with nodes, and we're coordinating with uh, parks and we'll be talking to NCTD coordinating with their our North County Transit District talking about where their bus stops and other good locations for coastal access are. Uh, one of the important aspects of this project is the community vision spaces. Once again, these are very, very conceptual, just illustrative ideas of what can happen there. Uh, the one on the left would be at Palomar Port Road intersection and then the one on the right would be the Encinas Creek area. Um, we there's all kinds of possibilities here and this is going to be really really important to engage the community and the stakeholders and what these spaces could be um, it could involve lookouts interpretive signage um, we can have little pop-up commercial areas like boogie board rentals or, or coffee carts with shaved ice and and smoothies and such um, i'll get to one of the challenges that we have at the at the end slide but uh, where the illustration that you see in the lower right is us using that in existing at Cena's Creek Bridge uh, for kind of a, um, a launching area and, and gathering area and such. So 
uh, current project considerations. So um, this scope, as I mentioned, the, the grant scope was developed in 2019. And as we know, a lot of things have changed since then. Um, one of the biggest ones was COVID. We were planning on this project being, um, and we still are pursuing, you know, a heavy stakeholder involvement, heavy public involvement, um, but COVID-19 uh, restrictions obviously put a completely uh, different change on the challenge or an opportunity on that. Um, the listening sessions have been remote, the workshops are going to be remote, and the public engagement is, is all remote as well. Um, there have been some cases where the listening sessions, having them remote, allowed other people, um, perhaps that weren't local, to participate, which has been nice. Um, so, you know, there are some opportunities there. And then also budget and staffing uh, restrictions that have happened due to COVID. One example of that is that um, the regions of UC restricted new positions. And so that impacted uh, SWIP's planning for having uh, staffing and the timing of their work. As I mentioned, we want to have this project uh, go straight from the Coastal Conservancy grant funded phase into a full blown uh, capital improvement project. So uh, we've been coordinating with uh, with the Coastal Conservancy on potential construction grant funding programs, uh, looking at some FEMA hazard mitigation dollars. Um, Coastal Conservancy was great. They identified the, uh, the latest cycle of the FEMA building resilient infrastructure and communities or BRIC grant. Uh, did a lot of work trying to position the city so that we can get prepared for that cycle. Unfortunately, the, uh, the time frame that it takes for uh, public works uh, solicitation and procurement and, and contracting just made the, uh, the grant timelines um, not feasible for us, but we're certainly uh, pursuing that grant next year um, and, and doing all the things that we need, like the benefit cost analysis in the interim that we need to do that. Uh, what that did though was it changed the timeline for consideration of the roadway and the community vision spaces and it's important to note that the habitat restoration component of um, is included with those roadway improvements so uh, we ended up in originally we were going to pursue all that as one big you know the roadway and community vision spaces um, simultaneously uh, we then because of the grant opportunities we had to split those apart uh, so that we can afford plenty of time for the community to involve um, in the visioning of those spaces. Um, but what that did was create um, potential conflicts with trying to look at habitat restoration and what to do with Encinas Creek Bridge. Um, probably from a habitat standpoint, it'd be ideal to just remove the bridge right up front. Um, however, it does provide a lot of opportunity for those vision spaces and it could be a phased approach. So uh, that's one of the considerations we're, we're, we're grappling with now is, is now that we've split the roadway and the community vision spaces, um, what, how to handle that. So as I mentioned, uh, the projects um, just started out and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to present to you about how we're doing. I'm looking forward to anybody's comments or questions. Um, here's my email down at the bottom of the screen. I'm happy to follow up with anyone um, offline if you like. Um, I uh, gave uh, Ella the uh, project webpage, the city's project webpage, if you want to learn there. And there's an opportunity to join our constant contact uh, list our list alert service so that you'll know when we, whenever we update that and with milestones. Um, I'm happy to check back in with the group as the project proceeds. And um, thank you very much. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Great, thank you, Mike. That was fantastic. And we're gonna switch over to Jessica Davenport now for our final presentation. All right, Jessica, whenever you are ready, you should have control. Thank you, Ella. Uh, can you see my screen and hear me? Yes, we can. Great, all right get this going. All right, hi, so I'm Jessica Davenport. I'm a Deputy Program Manager with the State Coastal Conservancy's Bay Area Program. And I'll be speaking about the sea level rise adaptation for State Route 37, which is known as the Flyway Highway. And I'll be focusing on the perspective of the conservation community in engaging in transportation planning. So uh, Highway 37 is a 21 mile road running through four counties in Northern San Francisco Bay Area. It's called the Flyway Highway 
because it crosses marshes and ponds that support thousands of waterfowl stopping to rest and forage before continuing their journey on the Pacific Flyway, which is a migratory corridor extending from the Arctic tundra to South American wetlands. Large portions of these baylands have been restored and many more acres have been acquired with the goal of eventual restoration. So Highway 37, its elevation is at or just above sea level. It's mostly within the San Pablo Baylands historic marshes, and it's surrounded by 30,000 acres of protected and restored habitat. The investment in this ecosystem exceeds $600 million for conservation and restoration. So in 2015, the transportation authorities of Marin, Napa, Solano, and Sonoma counties agreed to form a partnership through a memorandum of understanding to develop an expedited funding, financing, and project implementation strategy for the reconstruction of Highway 37 to withstand rising seas and storm surges while improving mobility and safety along the route. And uh, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, or MTC, as well as Caltrans were later added to this MOU. And this group, uh, the elected officials and other leading officials of these agencies um, meet regularly as the Highway 37 Policy Committee that actually met this morning uh, to get some updates. So they meet every couple of months and the public is invited to attend and participate. Um, so, as this group gathered speed after yet another flooding of Highway 37 and a, an urgency, the uh, conservation groups in the area became nervous that this road would be rebuilt on a huge dam, basically an embankment across the entire North Bay with a few spaces for bridges. And they were very concerned that that would be not a good thing for the restoration um, that had been done so far and that was planned for the future. Um, so in response, uh, several groups came together to form the State Route 37 Balans Group. And um, so this, in addition to uh, the Coastal Conservancy, uh, this group well, let me just tell you a little bit about the Conservancy's role. So um, the Conservancy is a long-term funder of the San Pablo Baylands restoration work. And we were invited by local groups in the North Bay to help coordinate the Baylands group. And um, also we have a role in promoting collaboration with the transportation and regulatory agencies, um, many of which are sister state agencies as well as the federal and local agencies. Um, so these are some of the key landowners in the North Bay. Um, and as you can see from this map, the whole area will be inundated by sea level rise by 2050. Um, so the balance group includes these groups as well as other uh, ecological restoration practitioners, um, scientists and other experts and other stakeholders with a long-term interest in the conservation and restoration of the San Pablo Baylands. So as this group came together, um, it coalesced around this message of integrate, don't mitigate. So in general, when transportation agencies uh, prepare to undertake a project, they may notice that there will be some environmental impacts that they will have to mitigate and they plan accordingly um, and they work with the regulatory agencies to figure out what that mitigation will be. However, when you have a project such as this that's really surrounded by an incredible ecological resource, um, you really need to go beyond mitigation and think about how to integrate this new infrastructure into the landscape in a way that would work for both. So the goal is to integrate any new uh, transportation infrastructure with the existing and future habitat that will be in this area um, to ensure healthy ecosystem function and resilience as this landscape changes. And fortunately, there was already quite a bit of work done on this area and understanding the historical habitats, as which you can see 
on this map. Um, and you can see that the highway runs right through a lot of these historical habitats. It does hit some upland areas as well as um, former tidal marshes. Um, and the Baylands Ecosystem Habitat Goals Report, uh, there's a science update that recommended the elevation of Highway 37 to allow for the full passage, the sediment, water, and wildlife. So the Baylands, goal, uh, the Baylands Group um, developed some goals to guide our work, because this is actually an area with probably at least 50 plans and projects associated with it. So it's just a lot to keep track of and know where to focus your efforts. And so we decided it was really important to put forth some guiding principles that would apply to any segment or any project in this whole corridor. Um, we also wanted to influence the specific planning processes that were going on for different segments and different projects and also to have our own ecological landscape vision, because that was a question we often were asked um, when projects were being developed. Well, well, what do you want to see here? So our guiding principles were, of course, to integrate the improvements to the road with our habitat goals um, and to promote ecological connectivity when reconstructing the highway to develop solutions appropriate to the landscape considering historical ecology as well as sea level rise. We really emphasize that the planning should be corridor wide, not in segments as it was initially um, being done. And also that the sea level rise projection should be based on the most recent Ocean Protection Council report. Um, we knew that there were near-term projects happening, but we wanted to make sure because it's a very congested road and there are some congestion relief projects being planned as well as um, some safety improvements um, with interchanges and such. We wanted to make sure that those near-term solutions protected the wetland resources and leave opportunities for future restoration. We also wanted to make sure that any future plans for this road would minimize financial impacts to low-income commuters. Um, there's a very strong um, interest in creating a toll for this road, and there's a concern that that would be harmful to um, the low-income commuters. So there's been discussion of things like means-based tolling, and also that um, this area, this corridor, include multimodal transportation options and recreational opportunities. So as the planning progressed, um, MTC, Caltrans, and the county transportation agencies did complete a corridor improvement plan, and the balance group guiding principles were incorporated into this plan. We saw the, um, the project, originally defined as a project, evolve into a corridor program with these five goals. Uh, so not just transportation and sea level rise adaptation, but also equity, ecology and public access and so that was um and the name that was adopted for the program was resilient state route uh 37 and in addition um the balance group participated in a, a more technical effort to analyze different alignments um so basically the problem with this uh, analysis was it was only done for the middle segment of the road, the two, um, two lane portion, whereas the other edges are four lanes, there's a middle segment that goes down to two. So that was deemed to be the priority for congestion relief. But when the uh, alignments were analyzed, it was an alignment, the northern alignment was just for that segment. So it really didn't make sense. And you can see it scored very badly um, for greenhouse gases as well as the environmental impacts. But nevertheless, um, this analysis, the balance group experts were successful in um, creating uh, an outcome that showed that the existing alignment on a causeway had much less impact than the existing alignment on a hybrid of a causeway and embankment. And a similar effort is going on for the western portion that goes from 
Way 101 to 121, a design alternatives uh, assessment. So another activity that uh, study that went on in this area was the public access scoping report. And this effort um, was undertaken by a group called Team Common Ground that formed during the Resilient by Design uh, initiative that happened all around the Bay Area to promote uh, climate adaptation. And so it was followed up with a grant um, to look more in depth at public access in this region. And so the Balance Group was able to encourage the protection of core wildlife areas and propose public access that is compatible with wildlife in those areas and focusing on connecting urban centers to the Baylands and surrounding overlooks. Um, so, and also supporting water trail sites, because as you could see from that earlier map, this is going to be very wet <laughs> and water trail is a good way to access an area that's going to be flooded in the future. So for developing an ecological landscape vision, um, the group began with this conceptual map, which showed the connectivity for water, sediment, and wildlife. Um, the group has also, members of the group have been involved in the Sonoma Creek Bayland strategy that was led by the uh, Son Sonoma Land Trust, and the Petaluma River Bayland strategy is now underway. So the Sonoma Creek Bayland strategy has um, brought together experts to come up with this vision of what could this area look like if restored. And, and this includes areas that are currently in private ownership, but there are willing sellers. Um, and so they came up with an innovative approach for this area. And I can share more information, but in, in the interest of time, I'll keep moving. But the point here is that in addition to coming up with a vision for the landscape, this report also provided public access guidelines and recommendations for Highway 37 and the Smart Rail Line, which also runs through the area. So how do we achieve this goal of integrate, don't mitigate? First, um, our focus has been on promoting highway design that enables restoration by participating in these design alternatives assessments. Um, we have created our own list of near-term and long-term ecological enhancement and restoration opportunities for the San Pablo Baylands that we've shared with the transportation agencies and the regulatory agencies as they've been developing their ideas about how to integrate these opportunities. And then um, a new effort that's just started is called Planning an Environmental Linkages Study. And this is led by Caltrans. It's the first time it's being done in California. It's a federally developed process and it's been done in Colorado and other states, but it's basically like a programmatic EIR light in the sense that it won't go into as much detail and depth as a programmatic EIR would, but it is intended to have a purpose and need, identify alternatives, have really broad stakeholder engagement and interagency coordination and get buy-in on a vision. Um, and as I mentioned, since there are so many different projects and stages and segments, it's really intended to knit that all together. And then another effort that is um, currently being developed with uh, a grant application going in is a regional conservation investment strategy for this uh, North Bay area. And uh, we'll find out if that uh, will go forward probably later this year. Um, so this is a long process <laughs> with a lot of different um, elements there. The focus is on the sea level rise adaptation phase as far as the conservation community. Um, but as I mentioned, there's many steps along the way. Um, so we're staying engaged as much as we can with all of them. Um, and so there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Where will the money come from to build the ultimate um, elevated causeway? It, it's estimated to cost $4 billion. Could the highway be moved inland? Um, I think that will be looked at in this planning and environmental linkages study for the entire corridor instead of just the middle segment. And could a passenger rail line be co-located with the highway on a pile supported causeway? Because even if the road is elevated, the railway will still be there and it's important to deal with both of them. 
And I think overall, um, some important lessons learned are to engage with the transportation decision makers at all levels, um, from planners to elected officials, and look for these opportunities to integrate and not mitigate. And building a broad environmental constituency, including the land managers, scientists, advocacy groups, as well as regulators, and being proactive to look at your landscape vision that can guide the recommendations for transportation infrastructure. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Jessica. Um, thanks everyone for these super interesting presentations and your fascinating projects. We're gonna jump to questions in the remaining five minutes. And the first one is for Alyssa. And the question reads, the Coastal Act requires that Highway 1 remain a scenic two-lane road in rural areas. This has been an important growth control policy for the state. Did the project consider this constraint at Elkhorn Slough? What land use planning and economic growth assumptions were made to frame the analysis of the transportation alternatives and possible future highway capacity? Yeah, that's a, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. And this is a really contentious issue. Um, you know, one of the things I will say is that, uh, you know, when we first proposed this project, we had um, kind of a, timed it to align with the Moss Landing community plan. And the, the thinking was that that would be wrapped up um, before we even started. And they are still in the process. Uh, of doing that pro project. And so there's a lot of questions that we had around what is going to be the surrounding land use um, uh, for this area. And so there was a lot of things that we couldn't assume. Um, and, and like I said, you know, this isn't ultimately, a, you know, a project with an identified um, adaptation alternative, but instead, you know, really looked at this wide range. And there's definitely a lot of disagreement. Certainly the question about uh, four lanes versus two lanes is a really contentious one. And I think will continue to be something that will be debated. Um, but really what we were trying to do was kind of look at the whole menu of options and try to get information to help